Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with a triple tribute to my home region, New England, my favorite part of the United States because it's where I'm from. Now, actually, I was born in Wilmington, Delaware, but at the ripe old age of like one, uh, my family, my parents, took me off to Milford, Connecticut, whence I have been ever since. And I love my hometown and I love New England. I love the whole region. I love the history. I love the geography. I think everything about it is wonderful. And Milford is a particularly lovely town, as we will get into in a moment. But these three works are by New England composers. They're by William Schumann and and Walter Piston and of course Charles Ives and they all have New England in the title they are all evocations of New England of course Ives is three places in New England which we'll get to last and the William Schumann is his New England sketches I think that's what they're called aren't they on um, the New England triptych pardon me and the three New England sketches are by Piston who is also a New Englander I think he was born in Maine and so all three of these pieces are in their way evocative of that part of the country, of that part of the United States. Some of them are landscapes, some of them are musical evocations of, you know, times gone by. Some of them are simply like three places, locations. All of them in their own way celebrate the delightful, wonderful, fabulous, civilized, part of that country, part of the U.S., which is New England, and my part particularly, which is Connecticut. Yeah, which is the gateway to New England. So let's talk about these pieces one at a time. Um, first, and I have samples of all of them because they've all been recorded by Naxos. Yes! Uh, ah, Walter Piston. The Three New England Sketches. Now, this is a fabulous disc, by the way, with um, the Seattle Symphony and Gerard Schwartz featuring uh, the uh, Symphony Number no. 4, which is a great piece, which no one ever listens to, and the Three New England Sketches and the Capriccio for Harp and String Orchestra. Now, the Three New England Sketches have three movements, because there are three of them. Yes, I figured that out all by myself, believe it or not. And it lasts about 16 minutes. It's a short work, a wonderful concert opener, which no one ever uses as such, of course, because as one of you agreed with me when I said Americans are so bloody insecure about their own music that they never play it. You know, it's just, oh, it's so depressing. Well, don't get me started. Anyway, the movements are Seaside and Summer Evening and then Mountains. So they're, they're rather generalized. You know, Piston was an absolute music composer. He wrote virtually no program music beyond, you know, the ballet, the incredible flutist, and then the New England sketches. But these are really evocative pieces. And I want to play you a little bit of, of the opening seaside, a couple minutes of it, the big climax. Wow, is it impressive. And it's wonderful. And, I, you know, I grew up. I grew up on the seaside because Milford has the largest coastline of any town in Connecticut. I think it's about 17 miles of coast or nine miles of, I don't know, it's a lot of coast and lots of beaches. And I grew up on Woodmont Beach when I was a kid. It was a terrific beach, which is on the Long Island Sound. You look right across it a few miles away and, and there's Long Island, which has, of course, you know, Brooklyn, Queens, Nassau and Suffolk counties of New York. And the Long Island Sound goes all the way out to Rhode Island because Long Island is long. That's why they call it that. And you could see it right across the, right across the shore there. But the, but the Long Island Sound was my waterway and the beach was where I used to play when I was a kid. And when I hear the, these pieces, when I hear this seaside piece, it really, it really, it really strikes a chord. I can't explain why. I just can't. But it does. So here is Walter Piston's Seaside from Three New England Sketches with Gerard Schwartz and the Seattle Symphony.
tactile, isn't it? It's such a vivid image of what he's describing. But you know, the funny thing about it is that he insisted that it's purely symphonic and he wasn't trying to be programmatic and bop 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 bullshit. <laughs> if that isn't a seascape, I don't know what is. And this is just a wonderful, wonderful piece. And the whole disc is great. This performance of the Fourth Symphony is the best one out there because there aren't any others. I mean, there, there, are, like, there was an, an older Ormandy one and I mean, there's just not much. And the Capriccio for Harp and String Orchestra is delightful. So, yeah, Walter Piston. Next, William Schumann. Now, I'm kind of hard on William Schumann because I find his symphonies rather dry and somewhat academic and annoying and, uh, you know, and predictable, actually. But uh, a bunch of you jumped on me for that and disagreed and said that you liked them very much. And, of course, that's great. If you like them, that's wonderful. They're there to be enjoyed for all those who feel that, you know, so inclined. But his, his New England triptych is quite an interesting work. It really is. It's on this wonderful disc with the Bournemouth Symphony Orchestra and, and Jose Cerebriere with Philip Quint violin in, in Schumann's Violin Concerto, which is also one of his masterpieces. It's a great work. One of the great 20th century violin concertos. I have no problem giving him full credit. But these pieces are really, really lovely. They're based on the music of William Billings. Now, William Billings was a New England church music composer, choir composer, who lived from about, what was it, 1744 to 1800, roughly that period, which was, of course, the Revolutionary War period. It was a, a wonderful time of artistic and political ferment in the history of New England. And he was famous for writing what is called what were called hymns and fuguing tunes. These were pieces that employed a certain rough um, polyphony that were designed to be sung in congregationalist churches where you know instrumental music was generally frowned upon and the congregation sang. You didn't have like choirs all set up and all those New England churches, those white churches with steeples. And I sang a whole bunch of these suckers when I was in high school glee club. We did William Billings and they were really fun. They're easy to sing. They're incredibly enjoyable. And, you know, some of them, they've, some of them have been recorded. There are a few discs of them. Henry Cowell created a whole series of works called Hymn and Fuging Tunes based on the concept by William Billings, not the music. Now, these pieces by William Schumann are actually based on Billings' music, but only in a very, very indirect way, for the most part. Some of them actually quote Billings. Some of them take Billings as sort of a launching point and develop motives and things. So you don't have to know the Billings originals, and it doesn't even really help. All you have to know is that when something sounds somewhat, somewhat um, perhaps, you know, older or modal or tonal, that, that that's the Billings part that Schumann is talking about. But they're excellent pieces. They really are. They're fantastically evocative and well-scored. And I mean, I even remember what we used to sing by Billings. You remember the Virgin Unspotted? You know, the Virgin Unspotted by prophets foretold shall bring forth the Savior as now we behold to save us. Though be our Redeemer from death, hell, and sin, which Adam's transgression involved us in. That's a Christmas one. <laughs> That's one of the happy ones. Actually, it is because the refrain is let us be merry because Jesus was born today, you know. But of course, it has to talk about death, hell, and sin, or else it wouldn't be, a, you know, a, a Protestant church type hymn thing. But boy, we had fun singing those pieces. They're just marvelous. And what I'm going to play you, let's see, there are three different, different movements, of course, because it's a triptych. Um, the Be Glad Then America, which is one of Billings' more famous settings, When Jesus Wept, and finally, Chester, which was both a hymn and it was used as a march by the Continental Army during the Revolution. Um, so it has a genuine period flavor and it's modernized considerably in this particular setting. But I'm going to play the whole final movement, all of Chester, because it's only three minutes long. And it's the Bournemouth Symphony under Jose Cerebriere, and, and it's just great. Chester from, from William Schumann's New England Triptych.
Wasn't that fun? It's just it's just a great piece, and, and I think the the mixture of old and new, and the tribute to you know New England during that fabulous 18th century period is really great. And it's also, I mean, if you want to explore Billings, it's very interesting to hear you know liturgical music, genuine community singing liturgical music from the 18th century. We're not talking about Bach. We're not talking about, you know, Beethoven and Mozart and those people writing liturgical music. We're talking about, you know, what what untrained voices in New England churches were going to be singing. And of course, they were all trained to read at least some music and play their spinet or whatever it is at home, um, not on Sundays. And, and this is the kind of music that they sang. And I mean, not Schumann's version, but William Billings version, and it's really quite wonderful. And Schumann, Schumann evokes it, um, I think, in a, in, a, in a very loving and sensitive way, but without compromising his modernist credentials. So that's a terrific piece and, and another aspect of New England culture that was really, uh, that I participated in as I was growing up. And all of it just sort of bound me more tightly to my New England surroundings. So finally, we have to talk about Ives, the three places in New England. And the reason I find this to be such a wonderful, wonderful piece, um, for me particularly, is because it has three movements. The three movements are um, the, the impression of the St. Gaudens in Boston, on Boston Common, which is a, a monument to um, Robert Gould Shaw and, and his colored regiment, the first um, African-American, or in those days, black or Negro regiment that fought in the Civil War. And this is Ives' tribute. It's a slow march, very dark and, and very, very, very um, somber. And then, of course, the second movement is Putnam's Camp in Reading, Connecticut. And Putnam Park and Putnam's Camp was a school trip when I was in grammar school. We used to go hang out at Putnam Park. And this is a festival. It's, it's a it's Children's Day. It's called Children's Holiday at Putnam's Camp. 
Well, I participated in several children's holidays at Putnam's Camp. There was a cool little cave that you could crawl around in it. It was really fun. And you'd go and have a picnic. It was a Revolutionary War site. Um, and Reading is, is in central Connecticut. It's, it's, it's about, oh, I don't know, it's half an hour or so from Milford. It's not far. It's to the north and slightly to the west. And it's, it's just a, a lovely New England town, you know, one of those, it's, you know, one acre zoning is what you'd call it, you know, a bedroom community with large lots and beautiful old homes. And the park is in the middle of it. And it's just a delightful place to visit. And I have very fond memories, although they never quite sounded like Charles Ives' version with its two brass bands crashing into each other and all the other, all the other crazy stuff that happens. And then the last movement, the last movement is the greatest of all. It's the Housatonic at Stockbridge. And first of all, Stockbridge is a beautiful little town in Massachusetts. It's right next to Tanglewood, the Boston Symphony summer home. And there was a covered bridge going over the Housatonic River, and it's still there. Um, and you can go see it um, because the music evokes um, an early morning and a covered bridge over the walking over the bridge over the Housatonic River where there's mist rising off of the river and you can hear a hymn tune being sung on a Sunday morning in the church, you know, nearby. And then it, it gains in intensity, I've said, until it becomes the river rolling towards the open sea. And it just so happens that Milford, Connecticut is on the shore of the Housatonic River. Here's the map of Milford. I got downloaded it for you. See, there's Milford. And you can see it's divided by the Housatonic River. Milford is on the right. The town of Stratford is on the left. And the Housatonic River divides them. It runs into the Long Island Sound from Milford. So that was sort of where I grew up. And actually, if you look at the map on the right of it, that little piece, you'll see a, a little bit that says Woodmont Beach. That's where I lived when we first came to Milford. And you can also see things there like Walmart and Costco and all that other stuff. But, but this, was, this was my childhood. And so when I first heard Three Places in New England, and I thought, the, and I heard the Housatonic, I mean, whoa, it's the Housatonic. It's, it's the river. It was my river. Damn it. It was my river. And Charles Ives also went to my high school. He went to Yale, you know, New Haven. But before that, he was at Hopkins Grammar, the prep school, which was designed as a preparatory school for Yale. And that was where I went to prep school. Um, and we used to have Ives festivals and all of this Ives stuff as one of Connecticut's great composers. And of course, Ives was from Danbury. And my father was from Danbury. And my grandfather operated Murray's Auto Parts on Main Street in Danbury, where Mr. Ives could get his auto parts. I mean, so I was all over this stuff. And so I was predisposed to like it. I mean, I was. There's no question about it. I was prejudiced in its favor. But I think my love for it is, is um, partly personal because that was me. And I think that's why, uh, you know, this is sort of an appropriate little chat. But also, um, it's just great music. And it, it makes me feel very at home whenever I hear it, even if Ives is a little nuts sometimes. I'm going to play you the entire Housatonic at Stockbridge because I do think it's one of the most beautiful and evocative tone poems in, in all of American music. I really do. It's, it's a masterpiece. And it's only three minutes long. And, you know, three-minute masterpieces really should be encouraged as much as possible by everybody who creates them. So this is the Malmo Symphony Orchestra, that great American ensemble, um, with James Sinclair, who was actually at Yale working in the on the Ives manuscripts, and this is his first edition of Three Places in New England. Ives prepared several versions of it, um, you know, with varying degrees of difficulty and orchestral forces in order to try and secure performances of it. But they're all, it's, it's the same music, it's just a question of how, how crazy some of the, the extras get, the decorations. Here is the Housatonic at Stockbridge, rolling past Milford into the Long Island Sound.
what an amazing piece of music that is. It really is. And so I just hope you've enjoyed this little, this little musical tour of New England. I thought it would be fun to do, and, and it, really, it really touches me deeply, all of these pieces. They really do. Um, I, I, you know, it's often said in the you know, world of classical music, because it's so European-based and European-slanted, you know, that there's, there is no real American tradition, and there's no, you know, and, and Americans, of course, are so insecure about their own music, but there is. There is, and it, it, it fills, fills me, anyway, with the same kind of warmth and pride and proprietary, proprietary, um, what's, the, what's the word? I don't know, proprietary um, foundation, you know, in, in, in my, my life that I'm sure um, so many of the famous European composers do for European listeners in their respective countries. But this music has a genuine identity, an identity of place. And that place is New England, and it's my place. So thank you so much for joining me, friends. Keep on listening. Take care.